welcome back to episode three of the World Class Stamp. We are with Kerry Bowley and we'll be talking to him about his future in the game and coaching and we'll be giving him a quick fire round of 10 fun questions. Remember to like and subscribe to our channel and have a world class weekend. Okay, so on to what you're currently doing now, basically. Um, so yeah, give us um, what you're up to, um, what <laughs> occupies your time and what's your plans after that? What, what, what do you want? Where do you want to be, I guess? Um, recording podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> So. That's good. <laughs> Talk, talking too much, some people might say. Um, no, so at the minute, my, my two major kind of roles are with ECNL, uh, Youth League in the US. It's probably the, well, it is, it's the biggest vehicle for youth football or youth soccer in the US. Way over 100,000 players, boys and girls. Um, supply more boys to college than any other platform, more girls to college than any other platform, and more girls to the NWSL, the professional league there. Than anyone else so we were in the draft this year because I was out in the convention in Anaheim 12 of the 14 first round picks all came from the league which is incredible um, 14 of the under 17 team that have just won the CONCACAF Cup uh, girls national team the US came from the league so it gives you an idea of the platform um, and where it's at so what I do with them is more around with the with the kind of technical leadership the leadership of the league, particularly the president, who I'm now very close to, uh, but I also deliver coaching methodology workshops for clubs, and we're, we're looking at the scaling of that at the moment in terms of some clubs have had the initial workshop, then how do we then go from a more generic workshop to a contextualised one in their club to impact coaches and players, essentially. Um, so that that's kind of that one. Great platform, something I'm really passionate about. Love the stuff they do um, and where they go in. Really professionalised the system out there in terms of, and I know people will go to the pay to play, but in terms of they need to go and see it, in terms of what's available there, the opportunity for both staff and players in that league compared to what we get in the UK is not even close. Not even close. You go to their showcase events and things like that, they're incredible experiences on their own. So when you talk about impacting young people, whether they become players or not, the experiences that they have along the way in youth soccer out there is just, well, it's unrivaled. I don't, there's nothing, there's nothing else in the world that where I've traveled that I've seen anything like that for youth soccer. Um, mm -hmm. Apart from maybe if you look at the Cat One academies here that can afford to take them everywhere, but that's different, of course, because these are not affiliated to professional clubs. Um, so, yeah, incredible platform. Um, and I love being out there um, with that work. And then the other one that I'm fortunate to work with, a company called Double Pass who most people probably know more for auditing initially. So they initiated the audit system for the Premier League before the Premier League had uh, PJAC, that now they, it's all in-house. Also did the same for Bundesliga and for multiple other leagues around the world. Now there's three strands to what we do. We have um, the audit thing still goes on. I don't do that, but other people do. We have education, like masterclass type delivery, um, of which I do do. Uh, some with sporting directors, some with academy directors, and some with coaches. And then we have club implementation, which is where we are at the moment in Turkey, uh, where we then take that kind of theory, if you like, and those masterclass things into their environment, try to impact the long-term development of talent within their clubs. So most recently, I've been fortunate to be at Galatasaray, Besiktas and Fenerbahce. I don't think many people have gone into all three clubs in one day, in one week, to be fair. Um, so, Brave. but yeah, <laughs> interesting <laughs> to, 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 to see what, to see what those clubs are, how they operate, really interesting. And then uh, a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll be, well, next week I'm back in Turkey with three other clubs, Samson Spore, Riza Spore, Trabzon Spore. Uh, Trabzon's one we know really well. We've basically worked with them for a full 12 month period, really developing their academy in alignment to their first team. And proud that they have more club trained players in their first team than anyone else, or more club trained minutes played by players from their academy than anyone else. So, um, so hopefully that's a little bit of the fruits of the work of the company and, and multiple people. Um, but also been in Norway working with elite Syrian clubs with their sporting directors and CEOs. Um, go into Romania, will be in Sweden shortly. They work in Venezuela, Hong Kong. They're global. Um, and the impact that they have, although not always easy to measure, the impact is actually huge because you see where some of these people are and the start of their journey to where they are by the time either we finish or we go into the next cycle of working with them. Um, and it's incredible. And the experiences you get globally for doing, understanding culture, understanding different markets and what the game looks like, what the challenges are, 
quite often the overall challenge is the same, but how you get to the solution is very, very different. So like you take Turkey to Norway, like polar opposites in terms of how you have to get there, how you have to work. Um, but yeah, really rewarding. Both organizations will know, and I, I, hopefully I stay with them for a, in some capacity for a long time because I really believe in what both are doing, ECNL and Double Pass. Really enjoy it. They've been great for me in the time that I've been out of full-time employment um, and the opportunities they've given me. So I'll always try to help in that way. But both also know that you know, being a technical director, sporting director is where I've always been on this kind of journey, if you like. Um, that doesn't mean I wouldn't go into a coaching environment again. But I have turned down quite a few of those opportunities in the time I've been out from Rangers mm -hmm. because I, that being a technical director is the main thing for me. Why? But, because but it allows you to impact academy and young players and opportunities like we spoke about Liverpool. I know some of the guys at the academy there um, and how proud they are now of their players playing in the first team. is natural. So doing that. But also I feel I'm best served supporting other people to be the best they can be. Um, and I think you, you can have more impact when you're in that role supporting coaches to support players than what you can directly to players. That's that's my that's always been my belief. So, um, yeah, that, that's what I'm really passionate about doing. So we'll see. There's been some conversation, but we'll we'll see what happens. Were those uh, coaching roles UK-based or could you have gone? A bit of both. A bit of both? Yeah, a bit of both. Um, across Europe and, and UK. So, yeah, so hopefully it turns out to be the right decision not to take some of them. Um, mm. But time will tell. Um Time will tell on that. I suppose that leads nicely into our next question. So, uh, yeah, so um, should uh, Geo come knocking again? <laughs> I mean, you've turned down a few opportunities, but if, if, he, if he gets his next job, um, maybe as a technical director, maybe as a different position, um, it, would you be? Would, would that be something hard to turn down for you to, to go and work for him again? Yeah, I think, look, I'm, I'm still close to Geo. I still speak to him quite a lot. Um I always said when I was at City, there would be few coaches I would go to work for uh, in the game, and he was one of them, um, and I did, obviously. Um, yeah, it's an unbelievable person, first. Um, when you talk about world-class, world-class is off the pitch as well, and you see how he is even now, and he's not playing anymore, but how he looks after himself off the pitch and the discipline, the commitment, all that stuff. He's an outstanding person, so... It would be difficult if it was the right environment, right challenge, right experience, then then maybe. Um, if if he wanted me to, that is, again, obviously, you, you never know, right? <laughs> um, but then yeah. there are also some in the football league. You know, some of the guys I've mentioned that I know know really well, um, really believe in the way they operate. And if I think I can add value to then then, yeah, I would. But there's, there's only a small selection in that way because it's not the route that I want to go first. It can still help, of course, um, but yeah, it's not it's not necessarily my the first option. But with him, it's a bit different um, because of that relationship. Yeah, definitely. One question I had just to finish off that little segment is: so do so? Does Gio have a team of people that he would ideally want to move with, or you know, if you're trying to get a role in a club, are you best being part of a group of support staff, yes. so to speak, or can you literally go in? Individually, I'm, I'm keen. Yeah. I think I think there's a there's a mix here, right? Yeah, he does have his staff. Yeah, um, and even if it's not fixed, does in every club I use the same ones. There are a group that you'll go to. Right. So when a job comes up, he'll go right. Who are the best four or five to work with me at this one? And he'll have the people that he's worked with before. And that that's a case for a lot of managers. In fact, someone like Ange bucks a trend on that because usually he goes to a new club and he goes on his own. Right. And he puts a new staff together every time he goes there. So. He's interested in that in that perspective, but um, yeah, I think there's some clubs that will have club appointed staff, and then there'll be the manager's entourage of however many they're allowed to bring to a club. And we used to limit that as City Football Group because we wanted to build something more sustainable than having six in, six out, six in, six out. You don't, you know, our, our game style is hard enough anyway to be able to deliver. Then you're trying to build something. And often for us, it was a market that wasn't like we weren't already the top club in there. So we had to really strive to get there and develop things over a period. So I think every club is different in that way in terms of how they do it. Um, but usually there'll be a minimum of one or two that will come with a head coach because they need someone who they know, trust and can help them initially um, get their ideas across, of course, with the influence. So yeah, they'll usually have a minimum in that way. But yeah, then every club's different. Every manager's different. And 
I suppose if Pep was going for an interview for his next job and he wanted to take X amount, I'm not sure there'd be many clubs that would say no because yeah, because of who reputation. he is as well, reputation wise, yeah. credibility and, and history of what they've done. So it's very very different and fluid, I would say. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Kate. That's a you know, very uh, phenomenal insight, really, uh, as a as a fan yeah. there, um, getting to know uh, more of the coaching roles of football. And uh, your journey sounds uh, fantastic, and may long it continue there. Um, thank you. Not quite finished yet. We have got ten light-hearted, uh, well, finish on the high. Q and A's. Um, right, They're a surprise then. to all of us. Yeah, sure? no, no, yeah, yeah, we got time. Yeah, yeah, we got time. Go on, then, Steve. You're gonna. All oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> where are we? First question. Um, Nice, hopefully, you know, easy one to start with. So you've travelled around the world, many clubs. You're walking into football club canteens. What's the what's your best meal you've had in a football club canteen for all you the travel you've done? Oh, wow, um, I think any meal at Man City <laughs> is like is like the best you can have. It's okay. like being in a hotel. Uh, yeah. Rangers was was top as well. To be fair, um, if I give a shout out to the chefs at Rangers, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd probably go with the. Uh, Something like the probably the stir fry that we used to have nice. at Rangers Football Club, top class. But all of it was was top. To be fair, so I've been privileged in that way. No cool. haggis. <laughs> no, we did have a bit actually. Yeah, <laughs> not in the club, but outside of yeah, that, that was good as well. But. Yeah. When it comes to player performance, um, how important is it again the the diet right to, um, you know, to, to prepare for match day? Lot lot of kind of maybe I don't know if it's old fashioned, but. I think I remember seeing drug bar saying you should eat uh, a bunch of pasta before games. Um, what what kind of uh, specifics go into that and, and getting the diet right to make sure players can perform for the full 90 minutes? Yeah, well, I think it, it probably changed in, in this country with Wenger, mainly when Arsene Wenger came into to Arsenal, he kind of changed that stuff. And then you see others like Conte even ban ketchup and other sauces and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's important, of course, it's come a long way. Um, there's an element of, you know, preferences in there as well because you have to get it right in terms of what the players like to eat everyone has their individuals around what they eat pre-match and and that kind of stuff as well um so that's a very individualized thing working with a dietitian around that stuff um and then there's the nutrition part and also you know what everybody needs in in terms of uh different bodies respond in different ways to different types of foods, different uh, deficiencies and, and all those kind of things that all go into it. But yeah, if you ask me how important, it's incredibly important, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That's the fuel for, for anything you do. So I say, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to win out. What's the cut-off date these days if you're going to get into football and you are, you're going to be in an academy or oh. I'm in a local side, it's getting more and more difficult probably to get into the world of football. I don't um, think you can get a trial, Math. So I, I was right. I think it's <laughs> a trial. Uh, you've stolen my punchline. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get so um, um, the, I, th- the I think I think it I think it differs depending on depending on where. And actually when I was in the symposium the ECNL, Martin Diggle, who was recently appointed Leeds United Academy Director, was uh, head of coach development at Liverpool at the time, went through each of the players and actually there was still a number that had only entered the pro kind of clubs at fifteen, sixteen um, so it depends where. I think in South America as well, depending on league structures and things, it can be very different. Um, in this country, is it becoming more difficult? Yes. Does it mean that it's impossible? No. Um, and actually, the academies do a great job, right? But I actually sometimes feel as if there's too much too soon. Right. Yeah. yeah. And kids need to be kids. And they need to have fun playing and not the impact that it has on families and siblings and everything else sitting in training grounds doing their homework five days a week because their brother's training. It's some of that thing that, you know, as much as it, as much as the good that's been done with it, and I really believe in that, you know, they provide some unbelievable opportunities and experiences. I still wonder sometimes, you know, is it is it right for an eight or nine year old to be traveling all around the country and training X amount of days? And, and lots of people will shoot me down for that, by the way, but... It's just yeah. my belief around let them be kids first because yeah, that's well, what they are. Still time. It's only like one yeah. percent of people actually make it to first team. So not point, not not one five. If yeah. you're talking about Britain, is that male? Isn't it? That's male. Different. That's male. Yeah, female might be different because of the number of players and, and opportunities. What would you say that? But that's, beca- is that's becoming tougher because now the WSL yeah. are starting to recruit foreign players far more than they used to. Definitely. There's far more money involved in the yeah. game, so it's becoming more and more difficult. And of course the volume of players playing the game is increasing every season. They're doing a great yep. job with that in terms of number of girls playing. Um, so it's still a great industry to be in. 
still gives you unbelievable experiences but sometimes I do worry that we do too much too soon and it's something that's constantly in my mind with my kids um, and it's hard isn't it because you who am I to say the system's wrong or who am I to go against the system but at the same time um, I do have some strong beliefs on some of that stuff okay Steve back to me okay um so I've got a couple of options here. What am I going to go with? Um, you may have slightly answered this one, but I'll, I'll ask it again. Um, what's your proudest moment so far? What's When you think of everything you've worked for, every way you've worked, who you've worked with, what's the single thing that comes to your mind straight away when you think that was good? World Class Stamp Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's a tough one, right? Um if I think about off the pitch, it's probably PhD. Okay. Because it's like a level that I never really thought I'd get anywhere close to, if I'm honest. Um, and I know what went into that, working full time alongside it, so it's that. And you see your, your family kind of at that event and how proud they are. And then probably on the pitch is a tough one, but probably PSV after the game away. It was my birthday as well, so that was All pretty right, good. Okay. Um, but yeah, just anything around like that or the first game at Rangers, St. Johnson at home, one of them probably, um, because that's when you feel that everything you've worked towards, someone else has seen that quality in you, in Geo, to have you at the club. And, and as a result of it being part of, of that with great people, it didn't quite go the way that we'd hoped over a longer period of time, but you'd take a step back and see what he did do over 12 months and he still did a pretty good job to be fair to him. Um, so yeah, probably, probably them. Great. Um, my question is more, uh, this, this will be interesting to hear your answer actually, because um, I think nowadays we're seeing a lack of flair players in the leagues and maybe that's down to the coaching element of the game, maybe coaching some of the flair out of players, sending players on, doing the job, they designed to the wider group, wider ethos. Um, is there still room for flair in the game or does that kind of, is that kind of a, uh, the shackles kind of being put on that in the development stage, so we don't actually see it end game to have that those moments of brilliance, um, like you'd get with a Matt Letizia, for example. Yeah, um, I, I do think in, in certain elements has changed in terms of what it, that looks like. Um, maybe less dribblers in the game, which is a problem. Um, so again, in some clubs, when I when I've been in there with double pass and they. They present to me like FIFA numbers of tournaments and that kind of thing and how long people are on the ball for and and then they start to develop their curriculums around it. I'm like, yeah, but that's a trend now. And that's a trend because we don't encourage dribbling anymore. So if we only encourage passing, then clearly they're going to be on the ball less time per action than what they are if they dribble. It's yeah. So don't get fixated on what the outcome is at the moment. And I think one of the biggest challenges, and I'm I continually preach against this stuff, right, is... You go on Twitter, you can find a practice and you deliver it. And we're becoming, in my view, too much practice-led in terms of what we coach as opposed to really getting into the nitty-gritty of what teaching and learning is and coaching is. And that's the bit that I'm most passionate about. So when I was at CFG, the methodology was never about sessions. It wasn't about playbook, send the playbook around the world and everyone coaches the same. It was about having principles and concepts of how we see the game. And then it was about working with every individual in the best way for them to coach what that game style is. And whatever practice, do whatever practice you want. I have some kind of preferences around like, does it look like the game? Because it needs to look like football. Uh, don't be stood around just passing the ball back and forth over 10 yards. Why? Because that doesn't happen in the game very often. Um, someone's going to try and kick you or kick the ball. So you need to try and make it look real. Um, but aside from that, never gave them a practice to deliver because practices don't develop players. It's the experiences within it, what they learn and how you coach and how you bring out those like, experiences, what you get them to draw their attention to implicitly or explicitly, wh however you manage it. But that's the bit that we need to get back to. And I think some of the best, like, the very best coach educator I ever saw, God bless him, was a guy called Dick Bate. Unbelievable. And years and years and years ahead of, of, of even some of the people where we are now. And most people I speak to that was kind of educated by him would say the same thing. He was the best by a mile. Um, and it was because he focused on the teaching, he focused on learning. Um, I don't think we focus on the learning bit enough in terms of how a player is going to receive this and what's the best way for them to receive it. 
I think too much we focus on where we're going to put the cones and the goals and what information are we going to give them without that part of actually do they need that information how do they need it when do they need it all those types of things that and that's what I try to focus most of my work on when I travel around the world with any of these companies is that part that's what I did at City yeah so it was never look at this video isn't it cool it was always about no your environment and it wasn't about me modeling practice on the pitch I won't do that even with double pass that's the last resort for me to go on the pitch and deliver it even if people ask for it because that doesn't make you a better coach it might do it might give you some ideas yeah. But it doesn't matter if I can coach your philosophy. Yeah. It matters if you can coach it because yeah. you're the one that needs to go and deliver it to the players week in, week out. I'm only here for one one or two occasions through the season. So you know, what impact does that have, actually? Yeah. Well, this might seem a bit of an old-fashioned question now for me, <laughs> but uh, when someone's not in uh, listening in training, are you a laps or burpees type of coach? Do you send <laughs> them off? <laughs> What's your uh, biggest punishment? No. I, <laughs> After I, that I, long, methodical I, no, explanation I, I think, of how to make someone I better. I think I would, I would like to say that you try to find another another approach. Yeah. <laughs> um, <to engage laughs> I that. Um, but well, all I would say with laps <laughs> is that you, you can use it as a different different technique. So when you think about positive reframing from a mindset perspective, you can use it for that. Give them a break away from the activity, go away, come back in with the right focus. So you can you can frame it in a different yeah. way, right? Okay. Um, so Still doing yeah. laps, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old you know, the kids or whatever, send them up to the bedroom, isn't it? Have a little think, come back, right, let's go again. So it's, it's almost break the environment bit if it's not working yeah. type of approach rather than punishment. I'm not, yeah, we can punish in whatever way you want, but it's... Very little has gained. I don't. Th I don't think from that. Usually, we just switch off or resent even more. All of us, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's included. So, yeah, yeah. true. Um, okay, so my third question here. So, I'm going to frame it a little bit differently. So, as an eight-year-old man, when you look back, eight-year-old man, <laughs> <laughs> when when you're eighteen, very mature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you you know career's done, retired, whatever. And you look back on your CV. You know what would be. What is for you sat here right now? What would that pinnacle be for you? Um, you don't have to be specific about it, but what? when do you think to yourself, yeah, I've achieved? When people think that you've done something to help and make them better. So that could be a, a multitude of scenarios, environments. So yeah. the, the greatest satisfaction for me is when you when you hear other people, or, or like third hand, I hear the information, I was speaking to this coach and they said you did that and it helped them. That. Simply. Okay. So Des Buckingham did an interview with Sky Sports and didn't have to, but name checked me in terms of the stuff I did at City, how I helped him on his journey. That for me is like, that's when it's worth it. So it's not, and that's why for me, being more of a TD is why I want to do that. Because it's not about look at that manager, look what he's won and all that kind of, that's not really, that's not really me. I don't like the being the centre of attention type stuff in that way. But when you see or you hear and you feel genuinely that you've helped someone, that's what I want to be remembered for. He came to us, tried to help, did his best to help, and and did this with us. That's it. It's a great answer, to be fair. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, my question is more uh, is is along the lines of helping players. Um, it seems like there's a trend in the country of going and spending millions of pounds on players, but after that they just land in the country. There's no kind of assistance helping them settle, finding schools for their kids. Is that something that needs to be improved on um, within the country? Um, you know, uh, that after, not after sales, but kind of after care for the player to help them settle. Because ultimately, happy player, you're going to get better performances. It, it seems if you've, you're touching on quite a few things here, I could talk about for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's two. getting better. You've got player care, um, academies, even first team level now. It's becoming a recognised kind of discipline. Um, there's some clubs that are doing a really good job with it in terms of the player care stuff. It's still in its infancy. It's a little bit like psych in that way, um, where it's still developing and striving to be what it what what it needs to be. And I think to be fair to those in player care and you know there's, there's the player player care specialist in Hugo out there. You can you can kind of go and look at. this done an incredible job. There are so many facets to it mm. in terms of like life skill development the kind of housing situation, as you mentioned, transitions, um, transitions through age groups in a single club, external mobility transit. There's so many things that go on and so many different individuals that you have to work with. It's almost hard to have a hard and fast, this is how you work. 
because it just depends on the person. Um, so I think it's emerging. It is getting better. The bit that you started with, which which is uh, a major passion for me, is that we've gone, and I think at every level now, we're starting to think about player trading and buying and selling and all that kind of stuff and forgetting about the development bit. Yeah. And that's why it was refreshing with Liverpool the other day because you see those kids come in and, you know, they, they've gone and won a trophy, <laughs> which is not easy to do, beating one of the best sides in the league, most expensive sides in the league. Um but not enough focus on development, whereas the game used to be so much more about develop players, get the players through into the first team, and the people in like technical director positions, that was their real thing. Align the whole club, develop, how do we get the next one through, even at first team level, and it's something we introduced at City, individual development plans for every first team, um, City football group, I should say, every first team player, and the impact of them was huge, absolutely yeah. huge, because we almost forget that they're still developing when they're in the first team, even when they're close to retiring. They're developing, they're just developing for something different. Mm. It's the next transition, and it's trying to be proactive with transitions. So, yeah, I think the player care guys are, are doing a, a good job. It's an industry or an element of the industry that's growing and will continue to, but so important, as you mentioned, for multiple reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I go one now, talking about uh, Pep, Pep and his prime then. Would you rate, you, you got asked this question himself at the FIFA Awards, I think, this year. Um, who would you rate as a better side? Prime Barcelona Pep or treble winning Man City? Treble winning Man City. Yeah. Above yeah. above Messi and Iniesta and all that. Yeah, but that. because it's been built and developed into that far more than what he had to do with those guys. I don't I don't even know what his answer was to it, by the way. He but said f off. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look, you've got incredible players, Xavi, yeah. Iniesta, Bushgetts, Messi, unbelievable players. Um, but at City, he's had to develop that project over such a longer period of time, yeah. whereas Barcelona were continually producing these types of players. All right, they were underperforming at the time. But yeah, I, I think they were incredible because when you listen to Fergie say that we couldn't get the ball off them, um, but yeah, when, when you look at City winning the treble, I think the, the league here is the most difficult league to win in the world. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely got the I think the it's the most difficult sides. to win, for sure. So when you have to do that and play the games for Champions League, then yeah, without the doubt. Um, and I would say he's the best there is, and he will be the best there was and ever will be. Yeah, Brett the Hitman uh, Hart quote there. Okay. <laughs> Credo. Um, I agree final, with that. Uh, with yeah, yeah, final question. Um, so this is the the cheekiest of the lot you know we run a <laughs> podcast we rely on getting guests not easy um just to warn you Matt Letizier did tell me to f off so you're well within your rights to but um if there's anyone you thought would be interested in coming on the world stamp world class stamp podcast um would there be any person that you would recommend to yeah, us th there, there are there are a few I will uh connect you with some guys after the call Appreciate I won't it. I won't Shout out to them now because it might put some pressure on them and yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, double totally. check with them where they are. But there's some good guys, coaches, and whatever in the game at the moment that I think will be good yeah. for you. Great. Uh, for well, sure. we'd be interested to hear yeah, yeah. more about behind the scenes. Um, talked a lot about it today, but we just want to thank you for your time. Definitely. For coming on yeah. show thank you today. for having me, Top man. Yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, getting an insight into behind the scenes and just maybe um for fans that are watching and uh, maybe students are watching as well, just to get that little bit of you know. Outside looking in, you don't see all the details. We only see ninety minutes on a Saturday. So much more that goes into it. So much uh, sort of uh, inner work in. So yeah, it's been great to have that time. So thanks for coming on the show, and uh, thank you everyone for watching. Um, make sure um, if you enjoyed the video, drop a like on it, and if you want to get involved in the debates, uh, drop comments in the comment section below, and make sure you subscribe to the channel also, so um, we can get more guests on and give you some more insight from behind the scene. But that's it for this time, guys. Have a world-class weekend, and we'll catch you next time.